leading to a situation like with Bismuth, where she was bubbled by Pink Diamond, and then from her perspective, there was a blink, and 5,000 years had passed, and all of her friends were dead. Ah, sweet! Man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. I've long criticized the tendency among cartoon fandom to push for more mature storytelling, but one part that's untouched is this contradiction where fandom wants mature storytelling, but doesn't want to accept the uncomfortable reality of mature storytelling. And this is important to talk about because it's a problem that people carry with them everywhere. So cartoon fandom is in this weird position where they will champion a story that deals with issues like loss, grief, trauma, sexual assault, genocide, tyranny, fascism, puritanical Christianity, abuse, neglect, and even chattel slavery, but the moment anyone suggests putting an end to the people responsible for these crimes, all of a sudden it's like you just said fuck in front of a toddler. For whatever reason, killing the bastard always seems to be off the table, even after an entire story where you watch them get progressively worse and worse, actually axing the bastard never seems to come to someone's mind. Bear in mind this is only the case if the characters are white, or men or both. Rather infamously, Star Wars spent three entire movies with a genocidal little piss ant slaughtering people on a whim before getting a hasty, rushed redemption arc, and was called the best character in the trilogy even by people I sometimes pretend to respect. But possibly the most interesting of all is Adam Driver as Kylo Ren, ostensibly the new wannabe Darth Vader. Right now let's talk about the best character in this whole trilogy, Kylo Ren. That is without a doubt the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You are a fucking idiot. Then Obi-Wan introduced another Darksider who had an actually developed backstory, an interesting motivation, and a fully-fledged character arc, and a list of crimes a fraction of the length of Kylo Ren's and was derided as annoying and another boring Darkseid redemption story, even by people who, not a week prior, were saying shit like Rey should have stayed dead and Kylo Ren should have carried on her legacy. Oh, and to top it off, I get another boring and predictable dark side redemption arc. I would make one key modification. I would have killed Rey for good. You can let Rey die as a super overpowered Jedi Jesus Messiah so that Ben can continue her legacy. Every time. I'm not gonna pretend this is equal opportunity villain simping, okay? So before we start with the whole people are fascinated about why someone would turn to darkness, no, no they're not. They're only fascinated when it's white guys. Let's just get it at that out of the way, it's not a disputable fact. It's very easy to tell when bigotry plays a role in someone's critique because of the inconsistency involved. People with double standards are never sneaky about it. I mean, how many times have you seen a female character or a character of color derided as annoying as a blanket statement without any other qualifiers? Reva was just such an annoying character in this show, is she essentially was the character that kept jumping in front of the reasons we were there in the first place. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, annoying is actually code for something else. But getting back on topic, with that asterisk in mind, Fanda will go out of its way to both establish an actual complete scumbag of a villain and then desperately try to backpedal like crazy once the logical endpoint of their actions comes back to haunt them. In my video on the dark side of the Force, somebody commented that if Vader had survived in Return of the Jedi, Luke would have been able to help him through his trauma. But here in reality... If Vader had survived, he would have been tried and executed by the New Republic because the writers of these stories do still have to think somewhat logically to an extent. The Rebellion isn't going to let Vader go just because Luke says so. That's why redemption in Star Wars so often equals death, because you ain't coming back from planet-killing superweapons. Like, you're just not. But sometimes a work doesn't think that through. My favorite example of this is Steven Universe, where the fandom will often claim that even if Steven wasn't able to mind control the gems into being completely subservient to him, they wouldn't have to kill the bad guys because they have an alternative. In Steven Universe, the common way to deal with gems who won't bow to Pink Diamond's will is to bubble them, keeping them from reforming and trapping them in stasis for an indefinite amount of time where they can't even consciously perceive it, leading to a situation like with Bismuth where she was bubbled by Pink Diamond, and then from her perspective there was a blink, and 5,000 years had passed and all of her friends were dead. Uh Ah, oh, sweet! Man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. It's my favorite because this kind of punishment in the real world would be viewed as so obscenely ghoulish and vile and despicable that most people would argue that death is a kinder sentence. Think about it for a second. Imagine you blinked and it was 5,000 years later, all your loved ones were gone and you were in a new world you had to adapt to. Most people in that situation would commit suicide within a day. Furthermore, solitary confinement is an actual thing we do today and it's considered the most vile, inhumane form of torture imaginable. It is a horrible thing to do 
to a person. And this is what Steven Universe fans use to argue against killing the bad guys. Oh, we don't have to kill them. Instead, we can do something much worse. Look, Steven Universe, I pick on you because you make it extremely easy for me. Now, admittedly, Steven Universe is an extreme example. It's the only show that goes really hard into gruesome war crimes, yet simultaneously tries to handle them like an episode of Dora the Explorer. No other show reaches that level of insanity. The Owl House might hand out redemption arcs like DoorDash hands out shitty coupons, but at the very least, there's no question that Bellos is going to get the axe. Dude planned full-scale genocide, he's not getting out of that alive. But that doesn't stop fandom from wanting it. Part of that is the trope obsession. Fandom loves serial killers, and they love Zuko, and so in their fatally poisoned mind, a good story should have both. This is why you get true crime ghouls simping over Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, they actually have been doing that for decades. They predate fandom. This extends to my biggest bugbear in recent years, where objectively evil actions are treated as morally gray just because people like the characters who did them. Obviously, there's the culling of Stratholm as an example, but my personal favorite is the Krogan Genophage. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. Yeah, they tried the same with us, but we fought them off. It's not the same. It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand, but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. Sorry, Rex. I wasn't trying to get you upset. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. Brief lore lesson for those who haven't played it. In Mass Effect, before the humans joined the Council races, there was a big war with the Rachni, a race of insect-like creatures. Before they managed to overrun the galaxy, the Salarians uplifted the Krogan and gave them spacefaring technology to fight the Rachni, because the Krogan were hardened from the harsh environment of Tuchanka. The Krogan beat the Rachni back, but now with spacefaring technology, they wanted to expand. This caused the Krogan rebellions, where the Council races tried to keep the Krogan from expanding, but with the advent of modern technology, they no longer had the disadvantage of Tuchanka's harsh environment. The Krogan had evolved a very high birth rate to compensate for the fact that living on Tuchanka was difficult. With having been uplifted, they were reproducing en masse and needed new worlds. In an effort to stop them, the Salarians and Turians afflicted the Krogan with the Genophage, a sterility virus that was supposed to reduce their birth rate. What it actually did was cause 999 out of a thousand Krogan to be born without a central nervous system and therefore be stillborn. The Genophage isn't brought up in much detail in Mass Effect 1, mostly through conversations with Rex. It's in Mass Effect 2 where the Genophage is discussed in more detail because because one of your squad mates, Morden Solus, had worked on a modified genophage in his past. The Krogan had started to adapt to the genophage, which the Council believed to be a problem, so Morden modified it to return it to its regular effectiveness. Now, Morden is the sole reason people view the genophage as morally grey, because they like Morden. In-game, everyone has different opinions, but the game doesn't really make an effort to defend the genophage at large. In fact, defending the genophage gets you more renegade points than any other decision in the game. But while Morden does make an attempt to defend his modification of the genophage, the the thing about him is that he does it in purely medical terms. What was the special tasks group doing with the Krogan genophage? Study at first, as I said, but uncovered surprising data. Krogan population was increasing at faster rate than expected. Krogan were adapting to genophage, overcoming disease. The genophage was a terrible mistake. It nearly destroyed the Krogan and their culture. Now they have a chance to recover. Naive viewpoint. Krogan too dangerous to allow unchecked birth rate. Look at Krogan rebellions. Personally led a science team, geneticists, chemists, sociologists, mathematicians, created new version of genophage, released it onto Chanka, other Krogan-centric areas, re-stabilized Krogan population. If the Krogan are so dangerous, why not just sterilize them outright? Not a war criminal, not a murderer, genocide, unnecessary. Krogan as a whole, violent, aggressive, still have outliers, worth saving. Genophage modification protected galaxy, allowed Krogan chance to survive. Everyone wins. Good for us, good for them. You never considered other options? Hundreds. Thousands. Modified genophage offered best outcome. Stabilized population, avoided publicity that could incite Krogan anger, averted potential genocide or devastating war. Best solution for whole galaxy, Krogan included. The genophage was a mistake bordering on a war crime. Recreating it is unforgivable. Don't want me on team? Don't bring me. Can stay here, work on collector research. But no apologies. Did what was right. 
hope you do the same if necessary. A 1 in 1,000 birth rate does actually mean the Krogan population will still grow in an ideal situation. He often calls it stabilizing birth rates, like he wants the Krogan to survive, he doesn't want them to die out completely. But the thing is, the Krogan are dying. But how could that be possible, you might think? Their birth rates are stabilized, they can still grow, why are they dying? Well, do me a favor, in your mind, picture 999 stillborn babies. There you go. See, while Morton justifies the genophage with raw numbers, he fails to take into account the emotional damage. The genophage doesn't just make it harder for Krogan to become pregnant, they become pregnant just as fast as they did before. Most of them are just doomed to come out a husk without a brain. A miscarriage is already one of the most emotionally devastating things you could possibly go through. Try going through 999. I knew sisters who couldn't bear the shame of being infertile. They would wander off into the wastelands, hoping a thresher maw would kill them and end their torment. Did the thought ever cross your mind? Yes. After my first stillborn. The Krogan have completely lost hope by Mass Effect 1, taking jobs on other worlds and largely killing each other off, because the psychological effect of the genophage has broken their spirit entirely. In one mission in Mass Effect 2, when Shepard says she understands wanting to cure the genophage, a Warlock officer has this to say. It doesn't have to happen like this. I can understand wanting to cure the genophage, no human, you understand nothing! You have not seen the piles of children that never lived. The Krogan were wronged. We will make it right, and then we will have our revenge! You can't refer to corpses as a pile and not come away thinking some fuck shit has happened here. The thing is, Morden's really the only one who thought this was a benefit. The rest of the galaxy knew what the genophage was, they knew what it was going to do, they knew the psychological effect, they just didn't care. Many of the other researchers who worked on the genophage ultimately came to despise it. Like Malin, Morden's assistant. Malin ultimately decided to work on curing the genophage, performing brutal experiments on volunteers. His methods to cure the genophage are completely and utterly unethical, resulting in the deaths of a lot of his subjects. But funnily enough, he never once defends it as moral. You honestly think the experiments you did here are justified? We committed cultural genocide. Nothing I do will ever be justified. The experiments are monstrous because I was taught to be a monster. And in Mass Effect 3, Morden ultimately comes around like a sensible person and then decides to cure the genophage. The decision to cure or sabotage it is ultimately up to Shepard, and players can choose to sabotage the cure, but only about 8% of players of the original Mass Effect 3 chose to do that, and only 4% of players in Legendary Edition chose to do that. The genophage is considered by a lot of people, even people I would respect, as a morally grey situation in Mass Effect. But the only basis for believing this is that players like Rex, and they like Morden. And if they like the character, clearly the situation has to be grey. You can see the bias in here. They're not human characters, but they're characters you like. Clearly they can't possibly do something bad if you like them. But the game wholeheartedly disagrees. In many places. The genophage isn't the only conflict considered to be morally grey yet affected by characters you like, and we're gonna come back to the genophage in a bit. Take the conflict between the Geth and the Quarians. The Quarians built the Geth as robot servants, and when they started developing intelligence, they tried to have them destroyed. The Geth fought back and drove the Quarians off Rannoch to float around in the migrant fleet for the next 600 years. Here's the thing. As you go through this story in all three games, you're gonna come to despise the Quarians. Not only did their idiotic decisions put their people onto the flotilla, but as you interact with them, their politics are so self-destructive, so blindly insular, and so pathetically fatalist that you almost want them to suffer the consequences of their own actions. Tally's achievements are the only evidence you should need. Come on, Tally. We're leaving. What? This is a formal proceeding! This is telling with the choice at the end of the conflict. If Tally and Legion are both alive, it's possible to negotiate peace with the Quarians and the Geth. Otherwise, you have to pick one, and the other will be wiped out completely. In the original Mass Effect 3, the majority of players sided with the Geth. 37% of players chose the Geth, 36 chose to negotiate peace, and 27% chose the Quarians. And I promise you, Tally was alive in all of those situations. In Legendary Edition, 80% of players chose peace, 11% chose the Geth, and 8% chose the Quarians. The Quarians are consistently the least supported choice in both versions of the game. The thing is, it's beneficial to Shepard to negotiate peace, as both fleets being alive means more firepower for Earth. But if it's not possible to do that, players overwhelmingly chose the Geth. And it's not hard to see why, because the Quarians almost seem to want to die. Hell, one of the dialogue options for Shepard that negotiates peace is to basically tell them to fuck off. Everyone listen up. This is Shepard. If you don't want to be blown out of the sky in about half a minute, stand down now. This is Admiral Talizora. Shepard speaks with my authority. And mine as well. Negative! We can win this war now! Keep firing! 60%. The Geth are about to return to full strength. If you keep attacking, they'll wipe you out. 
A few years ago, I saved you from the Geth at the Citadel. Just recently, I helped you take out that Dreadnought. 80%. But I'm through saving you. If you keep attacking, I will stand and watch while the Geth lay you to waste. It's your call. Kila Salai. All units, hold fire. The Corians in the entire conflict with the Geth are universally in the wrong, and the only people who argue otherwise usually do so because they're horny for Tally. Indeed, this rather shallow affection for individual characters is what determines a lot of people's decisions on morality in these situations. Which is understandable, Bioware games are character-focused, they're not world-focused like Fallout. In Fallout, most characters are cardboard cutouts who spew philosophy at you, but Bioware games have a more found family vibe toward them. It makes sense people let their personal feelings about certain characters dictate the broader political decisions in these games. This is especially true given that the Mass Effect games reward pragmatism. It's generally considered a good idea to save Malin's unethically gained genophage research, even though that crosses into Operation Paperclip territory, because the main plot of the game is about galactic annihilation coming down your door. Stopping the Reapers does have a tendency to affect your moral decisions, and you know, that's fine, you do what you gotta do. That's why Renegade isn't actually the evil path. You can't side with the Reapers if you go to Renegade, you're always on the same goal, just with a different level of what you're willing to do to achieve it. Okay, well that's all well and good, Lily, but you said people apply this to real life too, right? How? Well, there's a collective fantasy among many people that true evil does not exist, that everyone does something for a reason, and that everyone has a complicated story. Some people believe this with absolute certainty, but the really hard truth is... Most people are not morally gray. Moral grayness doesn't really exist in real life if you have all the information. Gray does not mean justifiable. It does not mean balanced. It does not mean everyone on both sides is kind of a jerk. If there was a good reason for the genophage, a justification for modifying it to continue the status quo, that wouldn't be morally gray, that would be morally fine. But there isn't. The long-term effects of the genophage were known, and they continued anyway because they just didn't care. Grey means you can't tell if someone is good or evil. It means you aren't sure. It means for every evil thing they do, there's a good thing on top of it, and you aren't sure where you stand with them. But in storytelling, Grey doesn't last very long. Unless you decide to keep the character's ethics up in the air, you're gonna have to render a judgement on them eventually. And not every character is gonna have the Reapers as a convenient excuse for everything they do. Give them time, people will show you who they are, you just have to start paying attention. And this is doubly so in real life. Most people we meet on a daily basis are not morally gray. They're generally decent but flawed, probably law-abiding individuals, or they're just straight-up selfish, greedy, callous bastards. You rarely encounter someone who straddles the line between good and evil. The idea that there are people who do bad things for good reasons or good things for bad reasons has been sensationalized by media when the truth is most people are never put in situations where we're required to do either. There's this old hypothetical about a man stealing a loaf of bread to feed his starving family, and whether or not that's moral. But the truth the truth of the matter is, what's really at stake? The profit margins of a large megacorporation? Who could lose half their stock to shoplifters every year and still turn a profit? But if you pull back, the truth is it's not even that man's ethical decision at all. Poverty is not a statement on the individual, it is a failure of the state. The evil was already committed when those in power allowed that man to become impoverished in the first place. So that ethical question is only able to happen because of an act of heartless, senseless cruelty that has neither reason nor justice. Furthermore, stealing from a large corporation, who the fuck actually cares about anyone doing that? The truth is, when people act with cruelty or malice, there often isn't a deeper reason for it. The bully picking on you at school probably doesn't have a secret traumatic backstory. It just makes him feel big and powerful picking on someone with less power to fight back. And he has a compulsive need to feel big and powerful. Could there possibly be a psychological reason for, the, for that that ties back to his home life? Possibly. Are you obligated to give a shit? No. And that is the underlying psychological failing of damn near every evil bastard that has ever existed. From the schoolyard bully robbing you for fun, to the internet troll having an absolute meltdown over women who looked at him funny, to your boss demanding you submit yourself entirely to corporate culture, to your landlord destroying your life over $600, to the autocratic dictator pathetically posing shirtless on a fucking bear so that the world will know just how much of a definite strong boy he is as his military crumbles hilariously into the dirt. And the main fundamental difference between all of these people is how much power they have, and directly how much damage they can cause. It's still the same mental deficiency at the end of the day, it's the difference between a stick of dynamite and a nuke. Explosions are explosions. We all know tyrants don't like to be criticized or made fun of and react very poorly when they are, but the uncomfortable truth is you know a lot of people like this in real life, they just don't have the power to ruin people's lives over it. I have a favorite saying that I stole and paraphrased from someone much smarter than me, Adolf Hitler was a guy. Just a guy. He didn't fall out of the sky, he didn't pass through a membrane from an alternate reality. He was a guy. 
A guy whose beliefs about Jews, the disabled, gay people, trans people, the Romani and Sinti, socialist, black people, Slavic people, communists, trade unionists, social democrats, and pretty much any religious group that ever looked at him funny were not unpopular in his time. Hitler stole most of his plans from the United States, which had pretty much perfected ghettoization, weaponized mobs, eugenics-based sterilization, and elimination of disabled people, and financial destitution as a tool of white supremacy for quite some time. The truth is that anyone who held any of Hitler's beliefs could have just as easily been the one to commit his crimes given enough power or influence. He had a whole fucking party of people who marched in lockstep with him. And before the Holocaust, his brand of eugenics was all over the fucking world. People were doing his bullshit, gladly gleefully, in full belief that they were doing something good for humanity. It's a common refrain from these fucking people, nobody is evil because they believe they're doing good. Yeah, they do believe they're doing good. That doesn't soften their actions, it makes them worse. That's not a comforting piece of information, it's darkly fucking chilling. It's horrifying to see just how warped a person's mind can be, that they think the mass slaughter of entire races of people could be a positive. You even think about coming after your brother and this bullet will be waiting for you. Then we'll see who's valuable. The thing is, the people who push this idea know, for a fact, that if they had power, they could easily become that kind of monster. Many of them hold these same beliefs. They perpetuate this idea on all scales as a self-protective delusion. Otherwise, what does that say about them and what they're capable of? They don't like that. This is why you see people call the alt-right an abusive relationship and claim neo-Nazis need to be saved. This is why so many people, mostly debate bros, are so obsessed with redeeming fascists. Because they don't want to accept the fact that any human being, and therefore them, has the chance to commit great evil for no justifiable reason. They don't want to accept the fact that some people are just fucking scum. Because it means they could be scum, and indeed, many people who hold these beliefs are scum. This is why garbage white men are currently throwing around the word woke scold, because their view of themselves is so delicate and survives entirely on self-perpetuating bullshit cycles, that even the mention that the thing they're afraid of could potentially be true is emotionally devastating to them. Because when you're someone who hasn't suffered an ounce in your life, and for whom our society bends over backwards to serve you, there is no greater crime than being told you're a bad person. Because ignoring the fact that you passively benefit from the suffering of marginalized people every day of your life, and the only way for that to change is the implementation of systemic changes that could potentially inconvenience you, is the only way you make it through the day without having an existential crisis or blowing your fucking brains out. This is why you should have no patience for anyone who makes excuses for dictators or parrots their bullshit lies they used to justify their behavior verbatim. Their, their ideology was not aligned with reality. How, how can you tell? Because Jews don't actually control banks in the world. There was a disproportionate number of Jewish control of banks in Germany during the Weimar Republic. All right, Wash, we're done here. Thank you. This ties back, ironically, to the genophage. Morden justified his work on the genophage on the basis that the original genophage wasn't a vile sterility plague that was wiping out the Krogan, and therefore helped wipe out the Krogan. The quickest way to become a monster is to convince yourself that monsters don't exist, and he did both, and spent the rest of his life justifying it and making excuses for it. And almost everything he did after that was his way of coping with what he'd done. He knew. Behind all the excuses, he knew what he'd done. His entire loyalty mission in Mass Effect 2 is about confronting the actual damage. Not on a report or a statistical spreadsheet, but in person. Seeing the desperation of the Krogan as they searched for a cure only confirmed what he already knew. He wasn't trying to convince anyone but himself. You're saying you were working just as hard to keep their population from falling? Yes. Could have eradicated Krogan. Not difficult. Increased mutation to degrade genetic structure further. Chose not to. Rachni extinction tragic. Didn't want to repeat. All life precious. Universe demands diversity. Pretty it up however you like. You're talking about murdering millions. No, murdered no one. Altered fertility, prevented fetal development of nervous system. Have killed many, Shepard. Many methods, gunfire, knives, drugs, tech attacks, once with farming equipment, but not with medicine. Sterile, werelock female willing to risk procedures. Hoped for cure. Pointless, pointless waste of life. I didn't expect you to be disturbed by the sight of a dead Krogan. What? Why? Because of genophage work? Irrelevant. No. Causative. Never experimented on live Krogan. Never killed with medicine. Her death not my work. Only reaction to it. Goal was to stabilize population. Never wanted this. Can see it logically. But still unnecessary. Foolish. Waste of life. Hate to see it. I didn't think you'd had much direct contact with things like this. Did you come to Tuchanka after dropping your plague? Yearly recon missions. Water, tissue samples. Ensure no mistakes. 
Superiors offered to carry it on. Refused. Need to see it in person. Need to look. Need to see. Accept it as necessary. See small picture. Remind myself why I run a clinic on Omega. Rest, young mother. Find your gods. Find someplace better. I didn't expect spirituality from you, Morden. Genophage modification project altered millions of lives, then saw results. Ego, humility, juxtaposition, frailty of life, size of universe. Explored religions after work completed. Different races, no answers. Many questions. Sounds like you were trying to deal with your guilty conscience. The doctor who killed millions. Modified Genophage project great in scope. Scientifically brilliant, but ethically difficult. Krogan reaction visceral, tragic, not guilty but responsible. Trained as doctor, genophage affects fertility, doesn't kill. Still, caused this. Hard to see big picture behind pile of corpses. Can you really just rationalize it all away? How do you justify it? Wheel of life. Popular Salarian concept. Similar to human Hinduism in focus on reincarnation. Appealing to see life as endless. Fix mistakes in next life. Learn, adapt, improve. Refuse to believe life ends here. Too wasteful. Have more to offer. Mistakes to fix. Cannot end here. Could do so much more. If you need this much soul searching to get over it, maybe the genophage was wrong. Had to be done. Brachni wars, Krogan rebellions, all pointed to Krogan aggression. So many simulations. Effects of Krogan population increase. All pointed to war. Extinction. Genophage or genocide. Save galaxy from Krogan. Save Krogan from Galaxy. So you're willing to sterilize a species based on the evidence of a few simulations? Yes. Millions of data points. Years of arguments. Countless scenarios. All noted Krogan fragmentation as dangerous. No unified culture to support repopulation. Would have been war. Turians and humans destroying Krogan utterly. Genophage was better. Saved lives. You could have cured the Genophage instead. Brought hope to the Krogan. They'd have rejoiced. Assumes human reaction. Krogan stimulus response different. Harsh environment. Take chance to fight. Flee. Would have caused chaos unto Chanka. Victor would have war economy. Bloodthirsty army. Galactic expansion only logical outcome. More war. Genophage saved lives. War would have ended. Look at the dead woman, Morden. It doesn't look like you saved her. No, it doesn't. Worked with available data. Only option. No other possible. Doesn't matter. The story of the genophage, of how the Krogan were used and exploited and then left to rot the moment they became inconvenient, is beautiful and horrific and sad and arguably one of the best stories Mass Effect has within it. And the reason for that is because it doesn't shy away from just how vile and unnecessary and unequivocally wrong it was. It doesn't pretend that both sides are equal. The genophage was a vile, unjustifiable evil, and the people who argue in favor of it are lying to themselves. Or they actively wanted the Krogan to die. In the last video I discussed how one problem with how people view characters is that if they like the character for surface reasons, aka their Blorbo, they'll often imagine the character was deeper than it actually was. And people's morality is just as flexible toward that bias. People will argue that nothing is ever black and white, that there's always shades of grey, and they say this as a self-protective bias. But some things are black and white, and we shouldn't shy away from that. Ironically, viewing the world as if everything is grey is a black and white view of the world. Sometimes people do things that are evil and irrational and have no justifiable basis behind them, and this desire to sanitize storytelling, strip that uncomfortable reality from everything just to put on a facade of grey is disturbing. If this was just something people did in fiction, fine, whatever. But as we've demonstrated, some people do this in real life. Look at how many Marxists will simp for Stalin, who ran a failing state and massacred his own people for an ideology of complete and utter failure. Some people People interpret maturity as accepting that everything in the world is grey, but I think maturity is accepting that human beings are capable of great acts of good, but also obscene acts of evil that have neither reason nor justice, and that every human being has that same capacity within them. Evil isn't an inclination or a nature, it's a choice you make. Trying to clamp your hands over your ears and refuse to accept that isn't maturity, it's not even innocence. Children can understand that some people are just mean, it's ignorance. It's self-protective ignorance. It's sanding off the edges of ourselves to avoid accepting what we're capable of. It is literally whitewashing humanity. A long time ago, 
My father betrayed me in this place. His own son. He tried to kill me, so I had to kill him. Right over there. That's what the genophage reduced us to. Animals. But you changed that today, Shepard. Now we'll fight for our children, not against them. It's just a pity Morden had to die. He told me he had to do it. Someone else might have gotten it wrong. He got it right for everyone. A thousand years from now, we'll probably be singing songs about him. <laughs> ah. I'm sure he'd like that. But you, Commander, we can thank you in person. Tell the Turians I'll be deploying troops to Palavan immediately. And when you're ready to kick the Reapers off Earth, you let me know. The Krogan are back in business. Goodbye, Commander. What will you do now? Spread the hope you've given us. Even now, there are clans gathering in the Kelphic Valley. I'll go speak to them and make sure this gift isn't squandered. Thank you for all that you've done. And know that Erdnot Bakara calls you a friend.